Welcome to Herbally Yours, an adventure into the world of natural medicine. Here is your host, Dr. Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse who will help you take the leap to ultimate wellness. And greetings. Thank you so much for joining me, Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse, for another edition of Herbally Yours, right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Herbally Yours brings you the latest information about the many facets in the world of natural living. And I am so happy to have on board with us today our really knowledgeable guest, Karta Pusing Khalsa. K.P. Khalsa is the President Emeritus of the American Herbalist Guild and current board member for the National Ayurvedic Medical Association. He mentored with Yogi Bhajan for 32 years, and along the way, he incorporated deep studies in Western and traditional Chinese medicine. His school has been training professional Ayurvedic practitioners, nutritional therapists, and herbalists for over 30 years. KP presents at professional conferences and is a prolific author, which includes his book, The Way of Ayurvedic Herbs. He offers in-person and online programs in all aspects of holistic medicine and herbalism. And a, a great place to find him is at internationalintegrative.com. So thank you so much for joining us today, KP. Hi, Ellen. Nice to talk to you again. Oh, I guess you're there. That's good. I was hoping they were getting you on the line. Now, let's focus on a specific topic because you're so knowledgeable in many topics. But something that many, many people have issues with are all kinds of cognitive challenges. And this can go all the way from, you know, youngsters to oldsters. So what are cognitive deficits? Well, it's a very broad term that describes uh, any aspect of being able to or being unable to manage your mind and your communication in the way you choose to. So it might be uh, memory loss, it might be looking to find words, it might be uh, having difficulty navigating in your uh, environment. It's something that people are certainly very concerned about, and we have seen the previous generation going through this, certainly, and uh, it's very disheartening to see people wandering away from home or whatever. So especially baby boomers are now uh, very concerned. Every time they lose their keys, they're, you know, do I have something serious? Most people do not, of course, and some uh, change in memory and cognition is normal as people age. You know, we just uh, saw a really interesting study uh, in the last uh, maybe two weeks, a, a major study that showed that, it, uh, strangely enough, it may be that one of the reasons people start have difficulty remembering things is that they literally are full of information. Not that the hard drive is full and can't accept more, but that your brain has to cycle through literally more material, that mental filing that we do to look for a word or something. It takes a little bit longer. That's pretty interesting. It makes us feel a little better about it, I think. Oh, so you're saying that sometimes when people feel that it might be something more serious, it's more likely that they're just running on overload. Yeah, that's what this new study seems to indicate, and that's what a lot of people feel. It's just that, you know, we crammed an awful lot into our noggin over the course of a lifetime, and, you know, let's just call it uh, wisdom instead of uh, forgetfulness. Oh, that's a good word. You know what I'm just wondering? I don't know if you have any data, but I'd be interested in your feelings about it. Do you think all the electronic waves that are now in the air, which really never existed, even there's no generation to even base data on, because it only happened recently, right? You and I remember when there were no cell phones, believe it or not, and we didn't have computers when we were working on our uh, schoolwork earlier. So do you think there has been any interference with the brain and, and cognitive issues because of all these waves that are now in the air? You know, I spend my time divided between modern medicine, modern science, and ancient technologies from things like Ayurveda and Chinese medicine. And you're right, we're right on this cusp where the ancient technologies can't give us the information we need because they never experienced these things, and it's too soon to know from modern technology. I, I hesitate to, to be too strong about these 
these concerns because, you know, frankly, we don't really know. Uh, but it just sort of the whole thing makes me nervous, you know, everything from microwaves to cell phones. It just doesn't it seems like it's more likely to cause a problem than not. But I can't really point to anything specific. I guess we'll see over the next few years. There are definitely reasons from vested interests why we don't want to study these things. If we discovered that our microwaves were killing us, it would be a big blow to the food industry. So people would prefer to sort of, you know, it's not obvious that something has happened. So let's not push it. So with your deep knowledge into ancient traditions, such as Ayurvedic medicine, it amazes me that when we do study Ayurvedic techniques, really how accurate they are and how effective they are at moderating various kinds of health problems and even things that, that are newer, like what's going on in current times. Yeah, it's really true. You know, Ayurveda has a written history going back about 5,000 years, and it was in its ascendancy then, but that's a blink of the eye in human history. So uh, we have the same bodies that our ancestors from that time had, same digestive tract, same nervous system. Our environment is very different, but people figured out over thousands of generations how impacts from the uh, world would affect them, and that would be things like when to go to bed, what kinds of things to eat, how to live your life, and it turns out that those techniques are, as you say, remarkably effective today. That always blows my mind, how much they knew without what we might call modern diagnostic techniques. And I'd like to remind you listeners that you are listening to Herbally Yours on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Ellen Kamai at naturalnurse.com, and my guest today is K.P. Kalsa. One of the wonderful things you can do with him is study because he has so many fantastic online classes and the best way to find him is at internationalintegrative.com. Today we're talking about cognitive issues and we're dealing with a perspective that KP Kalsa has from both the perspective of ancient technology and modern medicine. Now you are also a, a chiropractor, correct? I uh, know I'm not a chiropractor. I'm a dietitian nutritionist. That's what my life. Oh, you're about. a dietitian nutritionist as yeah. well as being involved in Ayurvedic medicine. Yeah, right. From the uh, conventional perspective, that's what my license uh, is. In you know, in the modern world, uh, we're not yet to the stage where we have uh, formal licensing in many of these things that we deal with herbalism, Ayurveda. We're working on it. Well, certainly you have been working on it for many, many decades and, you know, with wonderful results. Now, a lot of people just think that memory loss and and getting kind of foggy is just a natural part of aging. Do you think that's true? Well, I don't think it is. I think it's mostly uh, nurture and much less nature, and it's things that people do to themselves that damage their nervous system. Some people probably have a genetic propensity to be more likely to be damaged from those things, but it looks pretty clear from more modern research that many, many things can affect this, um, things like uh, curcumin, the constituent in turmeric, and other things that we could mention that show tremendous promise. One of my colleagues, uh, who is a big wig in the Alzheimer's world and also practices integrative medicine, uh, was telling me just the other day, we were looking at some PET scans of people with diminished cognition, and then he showed me their PET scans after they'd done some natural therapies of various kinds and a dramatic difference. I mean, they were lighting up like a Christmas tree. So we think that probably the next few years is going to be a real fertile time for these things. And I've definitely seen turnarounds uh, from people. Most Americans, as they age, get the sense that they should be old and they should start acting like old people. And so it's a combination of expectation, lifestyle. If you don't exercise, then you're going to hurt. If you hurt, you don't want to exercise. So all those things add up together, and then with some kind of genetic propensity. But I feel like if there's anybody that could keep their marbles, then we all should be able to. So I look at somebody like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a Supreme Court justice, a sharp as a tack in advanced age. And, uh, you know, we could look at any of these Supreme Court justices, I suppose, you know. Now, she did fall asleep during the State of the Union a couple years ago, but she blamed it on the wine she had with dinner, so we'll give her that pass. I know, that was really funny. 
And, you know, she's certainly still at it, so I think that's a good example. Now, I'm very interested in what you just talked about in terms of sort of a before and after someone who did have parts of their brain that was not showing up on a CAT scan, did you say, or a PET scan? Oh, the PET scan, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, is that person going to publish that research, or was it just clinical data within a, one place? No, it's very much done, uh, in the process of being uh, being published, and I was just looking at the experimental data on a laptop. But, you know, the PET scans allow you to have a graphic representation of what the brain looks like, and the brains of these people who had cognitive decline were sort of dull and you know, lifeless, I guess you could say. And then afterward, they were studying numerous things from nutritional therapies to meditation to lifestyle kinds of issues. This work was all being done at the University of Pennsylvania, so I assume anybody could uh, check into it. That's very exciting. I can't wait to see it when it comes out. Um, Just what you said is interesting in terms of mainstream medicine saying at times that things that study natural remedies they don't like the studies because you're not isolating one variable. Like you're talking about a full lifestyle change, which really works. We know that with holistic therapies, we will usually do that. We will look at the stress levels. We will look at the diet. We will look at the lifestyle, make changes there, and also add in specific botanical therapeutics, such as you mentioned, like turmeric. And then the the entire picture changes. But from a research perspective, sometimes uh, you know more conventional physicians like to see one thing changed only yeah it's true and it's a bit of a problem for the way we work and especially the bigger older systems all the big three which would include not only Ayurveda and Chinese medicine but Western natural healing naturopathy uh, focus on doing everything possible to help people get better and most people don't really care what it is that's that's working they just want to get better and they feel better and that does does uh, involve the possibility of uh, not knowing what you did that works. So research try, researchers try to ferret it out. And, of course, that just creates a very long, slow slog through the research process because every one of these studies is expensive. You don't know exactly what to control for. The fact that we found out that, tu- that curcumin from turmeric uh, was a benefit was basically an accident. A bunch of researchers sort of made the right guesses about things and turned out to be right. And now we have thousands of studies on uh, curcumin. But it's, it's very uh, tedious. Uh, it probably needs to be done one way or another, but that doesn't mean that we need to stop doing the kinds of things that we're doing. And we can take the information from all over and put it together, which is what uh, integrative colleagues are doing. And it seems to be working very, very well. It really does. Now, you're using the term uh, curcumin, and then turmeric. So we're going to take a little one-minute break right here, and when we come back, we'll go into that more deeply because not everyone in our listening audience, although you and I know, you know, they're related to each other, but we'll go into that more deeply for our listening audience. So we're just going to take a little break here, and I want you to know that you are listening to Herbally Yours on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Listen live or online at ncc.edu backslash WHPC. For more information on today's guest or topic, email whpc at ncc.edu. Stay tuned. Herbally Yours will be right back. Mommy, why are we going to the store? Mom, Mom I want Mommy. juice. Mom, juice, 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 Mommy, juice, juice, juice. Mom. Juice, juice, juice. Your child will have different needs at different stages of life, and that includes the car seat. That's right, the car seat. A car seat isn't one size fits all. You have to have the right seat based on your child's age, weight, and height. See, car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. But there's a website that gives you all the information you need. Safercar.gov slash the right seat. You'll find out about types of seats, when to have a seat rear-facing, when to switch it to forward-facing, when it's time for a booster seat, and when it's time for your child to ride in the back seat with a seat belt. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. Go to safercar.gov slash the right seat. That's safercar.gov slash the right seat. 
A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. And welcome back once again.